Joined still for the next uh, 30 minutes by Susan MacArthur with uh, Jacob Securities. And we are kicking off right now a uh, piece that we're doing all week on, um, as if there's not enough to worry about, quite frankly, <laughs> exactly. in the financial world. Don't um, touch your computer. <laughs> yeah, cyber weapons and talking about um, cyber attacks that can take place on governments, on business, and on individuals. And it's something that needs to be factored in when people are looking at, at how things work. And just to give you a, a bit of a setup here, Here's the kind of things that, that governments are, are dealing with right now in terms of uh, um, cyber attacks. The Pentagon has unveiled its first formal cyber strategy, as have many governments around the world. Uh, but in 2001, there was a cyber attack that hit Ottawa, including the Department of Finance. Uh, in 2011, defense contractor Lockheed Martin was hacked. Uh, and again, you would think they would, uh, and they, they at this point, believe it was a, a hack done by the Chinese government. Uh, in 2009, this, this story is so fascinating, Stuxnet uh, is a virus uh, that was created, and although it's never been admitted to publicly, right. it's widely believed that it was an Israeli-U.S. government collaboration, and it actually was an industrial um, virus that went into some of the uh, uh, machinery that helped uh, refine uh, uranium, those kinds of things, and spun them out of control. Right. Well, basically, it shut down the Iranian uh, nuclear facility. Exactly, yeah. So, right. and, and with that, that one thing. So, uh, now, they're also saying right now that research by a security company called Sophos uh, showed that China has overtaken the U.S. in hosting web pages that secretly install malicious programs on computers to steal private information. That's governments. Now, here is companies, okay? Some more examples. 2011, Sony PlayStation was hacked. A hundred million people's user data was stolen. Uh, in 2008, the Best Western Hotel Group had a hack that they lost about $4.4 uh, billion, about 2.8 uh, billion pounds. It was named one of the biggest cyber crime incidents ever. And in 2011, uh, Symantec found a new Stuxnet-like virus. Um, actually, they, they're, they're concerned they could find something like this. I don't think they found it, but they found a virus. Uh, and could it open oil rig valves. I mean, think about this. I mean, yeah, this no, it's, it's a huge issue. I can tell you it's something that is very top of mind on boardrooms around the country at government level, and it, it's a real issue that people really need to be thinking about yeah. very, very seriously. Yeah, and, and the question is, you know, for, for many of us, it's, just, it's such a complicated thing to think about. It's hard to begin. Now, so there's governments, there's companies. What about you? How vulnerable are you? Right. Well, um, according to a company called Panda Labs, they have some interesting stats for us. Take a look at this. They said you can purchase bank details, okay, uh, and these are people with six-figure balances for eighty to seven hundred dollars. There's a complete marketplace online where you can find all this information. It's a bit terrifying. I don't bank online. There, wait, oh well, that's another question we'll get into. Um, you can publish a fake online store for thirty to three hundred dollars. Again, no intent on actually fulfilling on services. Just take the money in. You can buy credit cloning machines, uh, credit card cloning machines, uh, between $200 and $1,000, and an actual fake ATM, which steals your debit card's credentials, and they can be bought for about $3,500 on top of that. So, I mean, there's all sorts of uh, great stuff out there. The point is, is the more that our information is digitized and out there, the more efficient life it gets, the more easy things become, but there are downsides to everything. So all week we're going to be focusing on these different aspects of this, and today um, we're fortunate we have a great guest with us to help us uh, give us an overview on all the major cyber threats that we face today. It's Charlie Miller. He's a PhD in mathematics and the principal research consultant for Acuvent Labs. But before that, Charlie spent five years working on cryptography for the U.S. National Security Agency, and he now spends much of his days, apparently, driving Apple crazy by finding bugs in their products. Charlie, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. I got you to smile on driving Apple crazy, so <laughs> yeah. you hold up. Tell, tell me a bit about, first off, um, and I'm sure you can't tell us a lot about it, but, but with the NSA, um, I mean, how, how big of an issue is cybersecurity from, from a governmental standpoint? So it's huge. Uh, if you think about, uh, you know, in the old days, the, the government's main responsibility from defense was making sure tanks didn't roll across the border. But now, uh, you know, with all the, all the information and all the finances that, that are stored on computers, it's totally different. So, uh, you know, we, we want packets to come into our, our country, but... Uh, you know, we don't want the bad ones, and so we have to figure out how to protect against attacks, but still let data flow freely between, you know, our country and, and other countries. And when you look around the world at governments around the world, who do you think is the most prepared to deal with these types of issues? 
you know, it, so the governments, they, they keep their cards close to their chest. They don't really talk a lot about their defenses and, and their capabilities. But, uh, you know, some of the things you've talked about earlier, Stuxnet was a huge issue, and that effect, affected Iran and some other countries in that region. Uh, you know, just in the last week, uh, there's talk that the drone that went down, the U.S. drone that went down in Iran was uh, a cyber attack against that drone. And, you know, that's, that hasn't been confirmed or anything, but so to, to think how much money and technology is invested in that and to think that it could be attacked by, uh, you know, a cyber weapon that maybe cost, you know, a, a million dollars or less to develop is, you know, just shows the sort of attacks that, that the government has to be prepared for. Who would cyber attack a drone? Who would have the capability of doing that? Uh, it's hard to imagine anyone besides uh, another government. So, you know, t governments are very, they don't talk about their capabilities, but, you know, if you think about the amount of time and energy and resources that would be necessary to, to pull off that kind of attack, it's it almost has to be another state player. You, you have to, we've been, I've been discussing this at home at the kitchen table with my 10-year-old, where we're both saying, why do they not have the technology to blow that drone up before they can show the technology to the world? What happened there? What went wrong? I, I mean, nobody knows, but uh, you know, the if you look at at the the people who build those weapons, you know, they're they're old school. They're used to weapons and explosives and missiles and and radar, uh, but cyber is new to them. So it's it's totally conceivable they built a weapon that you couldn't shoot down with a rocket, but you know, with a few you know taps of a keyboard, you could do it. But you know, at this point, it's still speculation. But it's still it's it's just fascinating to think about. Charlie, I, we're kind of covering a lot of ground with you, but I want to talk to you a bit about Apple. And I understand that you were expelled from the App Store's developer network. How come? So I, uh, you know, one of the things I do is I, I find vulnerabilities in products, and you know, I do this at work as a consultant and also just in my spare time. And I had found this problem with the way that their phones handled the app. So you know, the the, the way that you get apps on your iPhone is you download them from the App Store, and that's supposed to keep us safe. And so I found a way that malware could get in the App Store. And, uh, you know, just through, uh, you know, I communicated this problem with them. And, and now it's fixed, thankfully. So, so, you know, for now, we don't have to worry about, um, about uh, malware in the App Store. And, and again, this is just another threat with, with mobile devices that, that, you know, 10 years ago, no one had phones that, that had personal data and fi financial data. But now this is very common. And, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want anyone seeing the stuff that's on my phone, that's for sure. So quickly, just, just talk a little bit about Apple versus RIM. We have a big debate up here in this country, and, and obviously uh, mm -hmm. RIM has held itself out always as a more secure network, for, particularly for business and government users. Uh, how do you right. contrast the RIM software platform handheld devices with the Apple devices with respect to security? All right. It's interesting because RIM has a, a you know, a, a reputation for very high security, and, and in reality, that's not necessarily the case. And so, what they really have is configurability and control. So, uh, an enterprise can, can you know lock down exactly what you can do on that phone and exactly the the types of things you can install. But when it comes to the security of say just getting attacked, so you visit a malicious website and it, 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 it attacks you, they're actually way far behind. So, um, so but Apple on the other hand. Uh, it's, there's, there's products out there, but they're still sort of just getting started getting in the enterprise. And, you know, what enterprises want to do is, you know, manage the phone. And so RIM has an advantage there, but when it comes to actually attacking the phone, Apple probably has an advantage. Huh, that's interesting. Charlie, I've only got about 20 seconds here, but let me ask you, for okay. the average person who's on Facebook, on Twitter, doing their thing, how vulnerable are they right now? Uh, you, you know, uh, they, as long as they keep... Uh, they, they, they practice safe computing, so they keep passwords, different passwords for different sites. Uh, they don't share them. They don't w wildly download things or click on email attachments. They're probably okay, uh, but you know you just have to be careful. Charlie, we really appreciate it. We don't have nearly enough time, but hopefully we can talk to you yeah. again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure's ours. Charlie Miller, he's a principal research consultant with Acuvent Labs.